Wagging the Moon Doggy, Part 1, by Dave McGowan, as read from the Center for an Informed America's website, which is centerforaninformedamerica.com. Follow the tab for Wagging the Moon Doggy under Features, I believe, and you can read along as well. Thank you to Dave, who passed last year after a very brief but tragic battle with uh, small cell lung cancer. Prolific researcher, voracious reader, our thoughts and prayers go out to uh, his family. Wagging the Moon Doggy, Part 1, by Dave McGowan. It is commonly believed that man will fly directly from the Earth to the Moon, but to do this, we would require a vehicle of such gigantic proportions that it would prove an economic impossibility. It would have to develop sufficient speed to penetrate the atmosphere and overcome the Earth's gravity, and, having traveled all the way to the Moon, It must still have enough fuel to land safely and make the return trip to Earth. Furthermore, in order to give the expedition a margin of safety, we would not use one ship alone, but a minimum of three. Each rocket ship would be taller than the New York's Empire State Building, almost a quarter mile high, and weigh about ten times the tonnage of the Queen Mary, or some 800,000 tons. Werner von Braun, father of the Apollo space program, writing in Conquest of the Moon. I can see all of you scratching your heads out there, and I know exactly what it is you're thinking. Why are we taking this detour to the moon? It all began a few months ago when I became very busy at my day job, as well as with family drama, with what turned out to be a very time-consuming side project, all of which made it increasingly difficult for me to carve out chunks of time to work on the remaining chapters in the Laurel Canyon series. Over the next two months or so, I pretty much lost all momentum and soon found it hard to motivate myself to write, even when I could find the time. That happens sometimes. Though it sounds rather cliche, writer's block is a very real phenomenon. There are many times when I can sit down at the keyboard and the words just flow out of my head faster than I can get them down on the page. But there are also times when producing just one halfway decent sentence seems to be a near impossible task. This was one of those times. I found a new source of inspiration, however, when my wife emailed me the recent story of a fake Dutch moon rock, which I and many others found quite amusing in which also reminded me that I had a lot of other bits and pieces of information concerning the Apollo project that I had collected over the nine years that have passed since I first wrote about the alleged moon landing. After taking a first look back in 2000, I was pretty well convinced that the landings were in fact faked, but it was perfectly obvious that the rather short, mostly tongue-in-cheek post that I put up back in July of 2000 was not going to convince anyone else of that. So I contemplated taking a more comprehensive look at the Apollo program, Toward that end, I pulled out my original Apollo post, along with various other bits and pieces scattered throughout past newsletters, threw in all the newer material that have never made it onto my website, and then combed the internet for additional information. Doing so, I realized that a far better case could be made than what I had previously offered to readers. I also realized that a far better case could be made than was currently available on the net. I was rather surprised, actually, by how little there is out there. A couple of books by Bill Casing and Ralph Rene, a smattering of websites and a variety of YouTube videos of varying quality. Virtually all of the websites and videos tend to stick to the same ground covered by Casing and Rene, and they almost all use the same NASA photographs to argue the same points. So too do the sites devoted to debunking the notion that the landings were faked, and those sites seem to actually outnumber the hoax sites. While suffering through the numbing uniformity of the various websites at both sides of the aisle, it became perfectly clear that the hoax side of the debate was in serious need of a fresh approach and some new insights. So I began writing again. And, truth be told, while the Apollo story may initially appear to be a radical departure from the ongoing Laurel Canyon series, it actually isn't much of a detour at all. After all, we're still going to be living in the 60s and 70s. And to a significant degree, we're probably still going to be hanging out in Laurel Canyon. Because who else, after all, was NASA going to trust to handle the post-production work on all that Apollo footage, if not Lookout Mountain Laboratory? I am very well aware, by the way, that there are many, many people out there, even many of the people who have seen through the other tall tales told by our government, who think the moon hoax theorists are complete kooks. And a whole lot of coordinated effort has gone into casting them as such. That makes wading into the moon hoax debate a potentially dangerous affair. Remember when Luther, played by Don Knotts, gets taken to court and sued for slander in The Ghost and Mr. Chicken? And don't try to pretend like you've never seen it, because we both know that you have. He goes into the court and a character witness is called and the guy delivers credible testimony favoring Luther, and it's clear that the courtroom is impressed and everything is looking good for our nebbish hero, Luther. Remember what happens next, though. On cross-examination, the witness reveals that he is the president of a UFO club that holds their meetings on Mars. 
The courtroom, of course, abrupts with laughter, and all of that formerly credible testimony immediately flies right out the window. I've already received emails warning that I will suffer a similar fate from people who heard me discussing the topic on Maria Heller's radio show. Not to worry, though, I have somewhat of an advantage over others who have attempted to travel this path. I don't really care. My mission is to ferret out the truth wherever it may lie. If at various points along the way some folks are offended and others question my sanity, that's not really something I lose a lot of sleep over. Anyway, a whole lot of people are extremely reluctant to give up their belief in the success of the Apollo missions. A lot of people, in fact, pretty much shut down at the mere mention of the moon landings being faked, refusing to even consider the possibility. And yet there are some among the true believers who will allow that, though they firmly believe that we did indeed land on the moon, they would have understood if it had been a hoax. Given the climate of the times, with the Cold War tensions simmering and anxious Americans looking for some sign that their country was still dominant and not technologically inferior to the Soviets, it could be excused if NASA had duped the world. Such sentiments made me realize that the moon landing lie is somewhat unique among the big lies told to the American people in that it was, in the grand scheme of things, a relatively benign lie, and one that could be easily spun. Admitting that the landings were faked would not nearly have the same impact as, say, admitting to mass murdering 3,000 Americans and destroying billions of dollars worth of real estate, and then using that crime as a pretext to wage two illegal wars and strip away civil, legal, and privacy rights. And yet, despite the fact that it was a relatively benign lie, there is a tremendous reluctance among American people to let go of the notion that we sent men to the moon. There are a couple of reasons for that, one of them being that there's a romanticized notion that those were great years, years when one was proud to be an American. And in this day and age, people need that kind of romanticized nostalgia to cling to. But that is not the main reason that people cling so tenaciously, often even angrily, to what is essentially the adult version of Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, and the Tooth Fairy. What primarily motivates them is fear, but it is not the lie itself that scares people. It's what the lie says about the world around us and how it really functions. For if NASA was able to pull off such an outrageous hoax before the entire world and then keep that lie in place for four decades, what does that say about the control of the information we receive? What does that say about the media, the scientific community, the educational community, and all of the other institutions we depend on to tell us the truth? What does that say about the very nature of the world we live in? That is what scares the hell out of people and prevents them from even considering the possibility that they could have been so thoroughly duped. It's not about being lied to about the moon landings that people have a problem with. It's the realization that comes with that revelation. If they could lie about that, they could lie about anything. Sorry, my neighbors are apparently listening to some music. It has been my experience that the vast majority of the people who truly believe in the moon landings know virtually nothing about the alleged missions. And when confronted with some of the more implausible aspects of those alleged missions, the most frequently offered argument is the one that every conspiracy theorist has heard at least a thousand times. That can't possibly be true because there is no way that a lie that big could have been covered up all this time. Too many people would have known about it. But what if your own eyes and your own innate, though suppressed, ability to think critically and independently tell you that what all the institutions of the state insist is true is actually a lie? What do you do with that? What do you do then? Do you trust in your own cognitive abilities or do you blindly follow authority and pretend as though everything can be explained away? If your worldview will not allow you to believe what you can see with your own eyes, then the problem, it would appear, is with your worldview. So do you change that worldview or do you live in denial. The moon landing lie is unique among the big lies in another way as well. It is a lie that seemingly cannot be maintained indefinitely. Washington need never come clean on, say, the Kennedy assassinations. After all, they've been lying about the Lincoln assassination for nearly a century and a half now and getting away with it. But the moon landing hoax, I would think, has to have some kind of expiration date. How many decades can pass, after all, without anyone even coming too close to a reenactment before people start to catch on? Four obviously haven't been enough. How about five, six, or seven? How about when we hit the 100-year anniversary? If the first transatlantic flight hadn't been followed up with another one for over 40 years, would anyone have found that unusual? If during the early days of the automobile, when folks were happily cruising along in their Model Ts at a top speed of 40 miles per hour, someone had suddenly developed a car that had been driven safely at 500 miles per hour, 
And then after a few years, that car disappeared for many decades. Despite tremendous advances in automotive technology, no one ever again came close to building a car that could perform like that. Would that seem at all odd? There are indications that this lie does indeed have a shelf life. According to a July 17, 2009 post on CNN.com, quote, it's been 37 years since the last Apollo moon mission, and tens of millions of young Americans have no memories of watching the moon landings live. A 2005-2006 poll by Mary Lynn Dittmar, a space consultant based in Houston, Texas, found more than a quarter of Americans, 18 to 25, expressed some doubt that humans set foot on the moon. The goal of any dissident writer is to crack open the doors of perception, enough to let a little light in so that hopefully the seeds of a political reawakening can be planted. There are many doors that can be pried open to achieve that goal, but this one seems particularly vulnerable. Join me then as we take a little trip to the moon, or at least pretend to. NASA had really wanted to fake the moon landings. We're talking purely hypothetical here. The timing was certainly right. The advent of television, having reached worldwide critical mass only years prior to the moon landing, would prove instrumental to the fraud's success. Wired Magazine Adolf Hitler knew a little bit about the fine art of lying. In Mein Kampf, he wrote that if you're going to tell a lie, make sure it's a really big lie. Truth be told, I'm not exactly conversant in the German language, so that might not be an exact translation, but it certainly captures the gist of what the future Fuhrer was trying to say. He went on to explain that this was so because everyone in their everyday life tells little lies, and so they fully expect others to do so as well. But most people do not expect anyone to tell a real whopper. You know, the kind of brazen, outlandish lie that is just too absurd to actually be a lie. The kind of lie that is so over the top that no one would ever dare utter if it was in fact a lie. You know, this type of lie, according to Hitler, will fool the great masses of people even when the lie is so transparently thin that it couldn't possibly stand up to any kind of critical analysis by anyone actually exercising their brain rather than just blindly accepting the legitimacy of the information they're fed. For example, the rather fanciful notion that the United States landed men on the moon in the 1960s and early 1970s. That's the kind of lie we're talking about here, the kind that seems to defy logic and reason and yet has become ingrained in the national psyche to such an extent that it passes for historical fact. And anyone who would dare to question that quote historical fact, needless to say, must be stark raving mad. Before proceeding, I should probably mention here that, until relatively recently, if I had heard anyone putting forth the obviously drug-addled notion that the moon landings were fake, I would have been among the first to offer the said person a ride down to the grip store. While conducting research into various other topics, however, it has become increasingly apparent that there are almost always a few morsels of truth in every conspiracy theory, no matter how outlandish that theory may initially appear to be. And so despite my initial skepticism, I was compelled to take a closer look at the Apollo program. The first thing that I discovered was that the Soviet Union, right up until the time that we allegedly landed the first Apollo spacecraft on the moon, was solidly kicking our butts in the space race. It wasn't even close. The Soviets launched the first orbiting satellite, sent the first animal into space, sent the first man into space, performed the first spacewalk, sent the first three-man crew into space, was the first nation to have two spacecraft in orbit simultaneously, performed the first unmanned docking maneuver in space, and landed the first unmanned probe on the moon. Everything the U.S. did prior to actually sending a manned spacecraft to the moon had already been done by the Soviets, who were clearly staying at least a step or two ahead of our top-notch team of imported Nazi scientists. The smart money was clearly on the Soviets to make it to the moon first, if anyone wants to do so. Their astronauts had logged five times as many hours of space as had ours, and they had a considerable amount of time, money, and scientific talent, and perhaps most of all, national pride riding on that goal. And yet, amazingly enough, despite the incredibly long odds, the underdog Americans made it first. And not only did we make it first, but after a full 40 years, the Soviets apparently still haven't quite figured out how we did it. The question that is clearly begged here is a simple one. Why is it that the nation that was the leading in the field of space travel not only didn't make it to the moon back in the 60s, but still to this day have never made it? Could it be that they were just really poor losers? In truth, the entire space program has largely been, from its inception, little more than an elaborate cover for the research, development, and deployment of space-based weaponry and surveillance systems. The media never talk about such things, of course, but government documents make clear that the goals being pursued through space research are largely military in nature. For this reason alone, it's inconceivable that the Soviets would not have followed the Americans onto the moon for the sake of their own national defense. 
It's not just the Soviets, of course, who have never made it to the moon. The Chinese haven't either, nor of any other industrial nation despite rather obvious fact that every such nation on the planet now possesses technology that is light years beyond what was available to NASA scientists in 1960. Some readers will recall, and young readers might want to cover their eyes and ears here because the information to follow is quite shocking. In the 1960s, a full complement of home electronics consisted of a fuzzy 13-channel black-and-white television set with a rotary tuning dial, rabbit ears, and no remote. Such cutting-edge technology as the pocket calculator was still five years away from hitting the consumer market. It is perfectly obvious, of course, that it was not consumer electronics that allegedly sent man to the moon. The point here, though, is that advances in aerospace technology mirror advances in consumer technology. And just as there has been a revolutionary change in entertainment and communications technology, so too has aerospace technology advanced by light years in the last four decades. Technologically speaking, the NASA scientists working on the Apollo project were working in the Dark Ages. So if they could pull it off back then, then just about anyone should be able to do it now. It would be particularly easy, needless to say, for America to do it again. Since we've already done all that research and development and testing, why then, I wonder, have we not returned to the moon since the last Apollo flight? Following the alleged landings, there was a considerable talk of establishing a space station on the moon and of possibly even colonizing Earth's satellite. Yet all such talk was quickly dropped and soon forgotten. And for nearly four decades now, not a single human has been to the moon. Again, the question that immediately comes to mind is why? Why has no nation ever duplicated or even attempted to duplicate this miraculous feat? Why has no other nation even sent a manned spacecraft to orbit the moon? Why has no other nation ever attempted to send a manned spacecraft anywhere beyond low Earth orbit? Is it because we already learned everything that was to learn about the moon? If so, it could reasonably be argued that it would be possible to make six random landings on the surface of the Earth and come away with a complete and thorough understanding of this heavenly body? Are we to believe that the international scientific community has no questions that could be answered by a return trip to the moon? Is there no military advantage to be gained by sending men to the moon? Has man's keen interest in exploring celestial bodies evident throughout recorded history suddenly gone into remission? Maybe you say it's just too expensive, but the 60s were not a particularly prosperous time in U.S. history, and we were engaged in an expensive Cold War throughout the decade as well as an even more expensive hot war in Southeast Asia. And yet we still managed to finance no less than seven manned missions to the moon using a new, disposable, multi-section spacecraft each time. And yet in the four decades since, we are apparently supposed to believe that no other nation has been able to afford to do it even once. While we're on the subject of the passage of time, exactly how much time do you suppose will have to pass before people in significant numbers begin to question the moon landings? NASA recently announced that we will not be returning as previously advertised by the year 2020. That means that we will pass the 50-year anniversary of the first alleged landing without a sequel. Will that be enough elapsed time that people will begin to wonder? What about after a full century has passed by? Will our history books still talk about the moon landings? And if so, what will people make of such stories? When they watch old preserved films from the 60s, how will they reconcile the laughably primitive technology of the era with the notion that NASA sent men to the moon? Consider this peculiar fact. In order to reach the surface of the moon from the surface of the Earth, the Apollo astronauts would have to have traveled a minimum of 234,000 miles. Since the last Apollo flight allegedly returned from the moon in 1972, the furthest that any astronaut from any country has traveled from the surface of the Earth is about 400 miles, and very few have even gone that far. The primary components of the U.S. space program, the shuttles, the space station, and the Hubble telescope, operate at an orbiting altitude of about 200 miles. NASA gives the distance from the center of the Earth to the center of the moon as 239,000 miles. Since the Earth has a radius of about 4,000 miles and the moon's radius is roughly 1,000 miles, that leaves a surface-to-surface -surface distance of 234,000 miles. The total distance traveled during the alleged missions, including the Earth and Moon orbits, ranged from 622,268 miles for Apollo 13 to 1,484,934 miles for Apollo 17, all on a single tank of gas. To briefly recap, then, in the 21st century, utilizing the most cutting-edge modern technology, the best manned spaceship the U.S. can build will only reach an altitude of 200 miles. But in the 1960s, we built a half a dozen of them that flew almost 1,200 times further into space and then flew back. 
And they were able to do that despite the fact that the Saturn V rockets that, that powered the Apollo rocket flights weighed in at a paltry 3,000 tons, about .004% of the size that the principal designer of those very same Saturn rockets had previously said would be required to actually get to the moon and back, primarily due to the unfathomably large load of fuel that would be required. To put that into more earthly terms, the U.S. astronauts today travel no further into space than the distance between the San Fernando Valley and Fresno. The Apollo astronauts, on the other hand, traveled a distance equivalent to circumnavigating the planet around the equator nine and a half times, and they did it with roughly the same amount of fuel that it now takes to make that 200-mile journey, which is why I want NASA to build my next car for me. I figure they'll only have to fill the tank once. Should be good for the rest of my life. But wait, you say. NASA has a very solid evidence of the validity of the moon landings. They have, for example, all of that film footage shot on the moon and being live directly into our television sets. I have to mention that transmitting live footage back from the moon was, was another rather innovative use of 1960s technology. More than two decades later, we would have trouble broadcasting live footage from the deserts of the Middle East. But in 1969, we could beam that stuff back from the moon with nary a technical glitch. As it turns out, however, NASA doesn't actually have all that moonwalking footage anymore. Truth be told, they don't have any of it. According to the agency, all the tapes were lost back in the late 70s, all 700 cartons of them. As Reuters reported on August 15, 2006, quote, the U.S. government has misplaced the original recording of the first moon landing, including astronaut Neil Armstrong's famous One Small Step for Man, One Giant Leap for Mankind. Armstrong's famous moonwalk, seen by millions of viewers on July 20, 1969, is among transmissions that NASA has failed to turn up in a year of searching. Spokesman Gray Hotaloma said, quote, We haven't seen them for quite a while. We've been looking for over a year and they haven't turned up. In all, some 700 boxes of transmissions from the Apollo lunar missions are missing. Given that these tapes are allegedly documented on an unprecedented and unduplicated historical event, one that is said to be the greatest technological achievement of the 20th century, how in the world would it be possible to lose, quote-unquote, 700 cartons of them? Would not an irreplaceable national treasure such as that be very carefully inventoried and locked away in a secure film vault? And would not copies have been made? And would not those copies have also been securely tucked away somewhere? Come to think of it, would not multiple copies have been made for study by the scientific and academic community? Had NASA claimed that a few tapes, or even a few cartons of tapes, had been misplaced, then maybe we could give them the benefit of the doubt. But perhaps some careless NASA employee, for example, absentmindedly taped a Super Bowl over one of them. Does it really seem at all credible to claim that the entire collection of tapes has gone missing? All 700 cartons of them? The entire film record of the alleged moon landings? Some of you are probably thinking that everyone has seen the footage anyway when it was actually broadcast live back in the 60s and 70s. We're on NASA's website, we're on YouTube, or numerous television documentaries, but you would be mistaken. The truth is, is that the original footage has never been aired. Anytime, anywhere. And now, since the tapes seem to have conveniently gone missing, it quite obviously never will be. The fact that the tapes are missing, according to NASA, have been for over three decades, amazingly enough, was not even the most compelling information that the Reuters article had to offer. Also to be found was an explanation of how the alleged moonwalk tapes that we all know and love were created because NASA's equipment was not compatible with TV technology of the day. The original transmissions had to be displayed on a monitor and reshot by a TV camera for broadcast. So what we saw then, and what we have seen in all the footage ever released by NASA since then, were not in fact live transmissions. To the contrary, it was footage shot off a television monitor and a tiny black and white monitor at that. That monitor may have been running live footage, I suppose, but it seems far more likely that it was running taped footage. NASA, of course, has never explained why, but even if it were true that the original broadcast had to be reshot, they never subsequently released any of the actual live footage. So I guess that's a moot point now with the tapes having gone missing. With NASA's admission of how the original broadcasts were created, it certainly is not hard to imagine how fake moon landing footage could have been produced. As I have already noted, the 1960s were a decidedly low-tech era, and NASA appears to have taken a very low-tech approach. 
As moon landing skeptics have duly noted, if the broadcast tapes are played back at roughly twice their normal running speed, the astronauts appear to move about in ways entirely consistent with the way ordinarily humans move right here on the Earth. Here then is the formula for creating moonwalk footage. Take footage of guys in ridiculous costumes moving around awkwardly right here on our home planet, broadcast it over a tiny low-resolution television monitor at about half speed, then refilm it with a camera focused on that screen. The end result will be broadcast-ready tapes that, in addition to having that all-important, grainy, ghosty, rather surreal broadcast from the moon look, also appears to show the astronauts moving about in entirely unnatural ways. But not, it should be noted, too unnatural. And doesn't that seem a little odd as well? If we're being honest here, and for my testosterone-producing readers, this one is directed at you, the average male specimen, whether astronaut or plumber, never really grows up and stops being a little boy. And what guy, given the once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to spend some time in a reduced-gravity environment, isn't going to want to see how high we can jump? Or how far we can jump? Hitting a golf ball? Who the hell wants to see that? How about tossing a football for a 200-yard touchdown pass? Or how about the boys dazzling the viewing audience with some otherworldly acrobatics? And yes, Neil and the guys did exhibit some playfulness at times while allegedly walking on the moon, but doesn't it seem a bit odd that they failed to do anything that couldn't be faked simply by changing the tape speed? When I attended a college, I knew a guy on the volleyball team who had a 32-inch vertical leap right here on Earth. So when I see guys jumping maybe 12 inches, if that, in a 1-6 gravity environment with no air resistance, I'm not really all that impressed. Am I the only one, by the way, who finds it odd that people would move in slow motion on the moon? Why would a reduced gravitational pull cause everything to move so much more slowly, given the fact that they were much lighter on their feet and not subject to air and wind resistance? Shouldn't the astronauts have been able to move quicker on the moon than here on Earth? Was slow motion the only thing NASA could come up with to give the video footage an otherworldly feel? Needless to say, if what has been proposed here is indeed how the moon landing footage in the public domain was created, then highly incriminating original footage, which would have looked like any other footage shot here on Earth except for the silly costumes and props, would have to have been destroyed. Because it's not surprising that NASA now takes the position that the original footage has been missing since sometime in the late 1970s. Unfortunately, it isn't just the video footage that's missing. Also allegedly beamed back from the moon was voice data, biomedical monitoring data, and telemetry data to monitor the location and mechanical functioning of the spaceship. All of that data, the entire alleged record of the moon landings, was on the 13,000 plus reels that are said to be missing. Also missing, according to NASA and its various subcontractors, are the original plans and blueprints for the lunar modules and for the lunar rovers and for the entire multi-section Saturn V rockets. There is therefore no way for the modern scientific community to determine whether all of that fancy 1960s technology was even close to being functional, or whether it was all for show. Nor is there any way to review the physical records, so to speak, of the alleged flights. We cannot, for example, check the fuel consumption throughout the flights to determine what kind of magic trick NASA used to get the boys there and back with less than 1% of the required fuel. And we will never, it would appear, see the original, first-generation video footage. You would have thought that someone at NASA would have thought to preserve such things. No wonder we haven't given them the money to go back to the moon. It Later on, I discovered Von Braun's initial on this Nazi document, which directly ties him to the management of slave labor during World War II. His full signature can be found on this Nazi document, provided to me by the German government in which he requests labor, including prisoners, for his rocket factory in central Germany. And finally, I found Werner's signature on this 1969 NASA letter, sent to an official two weeks after the Apollo mission, in which he admits being a member of Hitler's SS. And to quote him, I would appreciate it if you kept this information to yourself, as I think it could only harm my work at NASA if all this were given undue publicity. Being the Moondoggy Part 2 by David McGowan Well, you now say, what about all those cool moon rocks? How did they get those? The moon is, you know, the only source of moon rocks, so doesn't that prove that we went there? 
No, as a matter of fact, it does not prove that we went there. As odd as that may sound, the moon is not the only source of moon rocks. As it turns out, authentic moon rocks are available right here on Earth, in the form of lunar meteorites. Because the moon lacks a protective atmosphere, you see, it gets smacked around quite a bit, which is why it's heavily cratered. When things smash into it to form those craters, lots of bits and pieces of the moon fly off into space. Some of them end up right here on Earth. By far the best place to find them is in Antarctica, where they are most plentiful and, due to the terrain, relatively easy to find and well preserved. And that is why it is curious that Antarctica just happens to be where a team of Apollo scientists led by Werner von Braun ventured off to in the summer of 1967, two years before Apollo 11 blasted off. You would think that, with the demanding task of perfecting the hugely complex Saturn V rockets, that Von Braun and his cronies at NASA would have had their hands full, but apparently there was something even more important for them to do down in Antarctica. NASA has never offered much of an explanation for the curiously timed expedition. Some skeptics have said that it is possible that moon rocks could have been gathered from the moon with robotic probes. But while it isn't being argued here that unmanned craft haven't reached the moon, it seems virtually inconceivable that any unmanned spacecraft could have landed on and then been brought back from the surface of the moon in the 1960s or 1970s. There's no indication that it can even be done today. It's been more than three decades since anyone has claimed to do it, and that claim by the Soviets is highly suspect. What is known for sure is that even some of the, quote, debunking websites have, albeit reluctantly, acknowledged that meteorite samples gathered from Antarctica are virtually indistinguishable from NASA's collection of moon rocks. Of course, as we have very recently learned, that is not true of all of NASA's moon rocks. Some of them apparently bear no resemblance at all to lunar meteorites. Instead, they look an awful lot like petrified wood from the Arizona desert. Such was the case with a, quote, moon rock that the Dutch National Museum has been carefully safeguarding for many years now, before discovering, in August of 2009, that they were in reality the proud owners of the most overinsured piece of petrified wood on the planet. The, quote, moon rock had been a gift to the Dutch from the U.S. State Department and its authenticity had reportedly been verified through a phone call to NASA. I'm guessing that NASA was probably running low on meteorite fragments and figured the Dutch wouldn't know the difference anyway. Or maybe Washington was a little peeved over the fact that the Dutch newspapers reportedly called NASA's bluff at the time of the first alleged moon landing. And you can see photos of these things, guys, over on the uh, website. I'd recommend go checking that out. This is not to suggest, of course, that all of the moon rocks passed out by NASA and the State Department are obvious fakes. Most, presumably, are of lunar origin, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they were gathered by American astronauts walking on the surface of the moon. They could have just as easily come to Earth as meteorites. It is also possible that they are of otherworldly origin, but not from the moon at all, such as meteorites from other sources that have been collected here on Earth. The only way to know for sure what NASA's moon rocks are, of course, would be to compare them to a, quote, control rock that is known to be from the moon. The problem, alas, is the only known source for authenticated moon rocks is NASA, the very same folks who are known occasionally to hand out chunks of petrified wood. The other problem, it turns out, is that most of the moon rocks are missing. Does anyone see a pattern developing here? Since the discovery of the fake moon rock in the Dutch Museum, quote, debunkers have claimed that the fact that no other moon rocks have been declared fake proves that the Dutch case is an isolated one. Quote, after that announcement, goes the argument, wouldn't every other country in possession of a moon rock have rushed to have them authenticated? And since no other country has made a similar announcement, doesn't that prove that the moon rocks are real? At first glance, that would appear to be a valid argument. The problem, however, is that the vast majority of those countries can't test their, quote, moon rocks because, shockingly enough, no one knows where they are. As the Associated Press reported on September 13, 2009, quote, nearly 270 rocks scooped up by U.S. astronauts were given to foreign countries by the Nixon administration of 135 rocks from the Apollo 17 mission given away to nations or their leaders. Only about 25 have been located by CollectSpace.com a website for space history buffs that has long attempted to compile a list. The outlook for tracking the estimated 134 of Apollo 11 rocks is even bleaker. The locations of fewer than a dozen are known. It appears then that having a control rock really wouldn't be much of a help at all, since nearly 90% of the alleged moon rocks that we would want to test don't seem to be around anymore. But I've also heard, you now say, that photos have been taken of the equipment left behind by the Apollo astronauts on the surface of the moon, like the descent stages of the lunar modules. How do you account for that? It's certainly true that there have been numerous claims over the years that various satellites or unmanned space probes or space telescopes were going to capture images that would definitely prove that man walked on the moon, thus settling the controversy once and for all. 
and in recent years, the debunkers have openly gloated whenever such an announcement has been made, boldly proclaiming that all the, quote, hoax believers will soon be exposed as the ignorant buffoons that they are. Despite all the promises, however, no such images have ever been produced, a fact that the debunkers seem to conveniently overlook while forever rushing to announce that the hoax theories are about to be discredited. For at least two decades now, since the launch of the Hubble Space Telescope, we have been promised dazzling images of the lunar modules sitting on the surface of the moon. The Hubble technology, needless to say, never managed to deliver. More recently, in 2002, the European Southern Observatory's Very Large Telescope, whose inventor apparently coined the name while watching Sesame Street, was also supposed to deliver the promised images. And seven years later, the fabled images have yet to materialize. In March of 2005, Space.com boldly announced that, quote, a European spacecraft now orbiting the moon could turn out to be a time machine of sorts as it photographs old landing sites of Soviet robotic probes in the areas where American Apollo crews set down and explored. New imagery of old Apollo touchdown spots from the Smart One probe might put to rest conspiratorial thoughts that U.S. astronauts didn't go the distance and scuff up the lunar landscape. NASA carried out six piloted landings on the moon in that time period, 1969 through 1972. Fringe theorists have said that NASA never really went to the moon. I'm guessing that most, quote, fringe theorists will continue to harbor, quote, conspiratorial thoughts for as long as pompous websites like Space.com continue making arrogant proclamations such as that and then not following them up with so much as a single image in well over four years. Who knew, by the way, that the European Space Agency had the technology and the budget to send a spacecraft to orbit the moon? Who knew that the Europeans even had a space agency? I wonder. Given that they obviously have the technology to send spacecraft to the moon, why haven't they sent any manned missions there? I mean, I would think that it should be fairly easy to send some guys to at least orbit the moon, right? I mean, all they have to do is add a couple of seats to the spacecraft design that they already have. They should be ready to go. Here's another thing that I sometimes wonder about. Why is it that in the 1960s we possessed the advanced technology required to actually land men on the moon? But in the 21st century, we don't even have the technology required to get an unmanned aircraft close enough to the moon to take usable photographs? Or could it be that there's just nothing there to photograph? Just this year, NASA itself boldly announced that its Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, or LRO, has returned its first imagery of the Apollo moon landing sites. The pictures show the Apollo mission's lunar module descent stages sitting on the moon's surface as long shadows from low sun angle make the module's locations evident. The LROC team anxiously awaited each image, said LROC Principal Investigator Mark Robinson of Arizona State University. We were very interested in getting our first peek at the lunar module descent stages just for the thrill, and to see how well the cameras had come into focus. Indeed, the images are fantastic, and so is the focus. Sounds promising, doesn't it? The images, however, hardly live up to the billing. They are, in fact, completely worthless. All they depict are tiny white dots of the lunar surface that could be just about anything that would be barely visible at all without those handy, quote, long shadows from the low sun angle. And the weird thing is about those shadows is that, in the very same NASA article, it says that, quote, because the sun was so low to the horizon when the images were made, even subtle variations in topography create long shadows, unquote. And yet, while it is perfectly obvious that there are more than just, quote, subtle variations in the lunar topography in the images, and you can see the images on his website, The alleged lunar modules are the only things casting the long shadows. Even if we give NASA every benefit of the doubt and assume that the images have not been amateurishly photoshopped and that the indiscernible white dots are indeed something of man-made origin, the most likely culprit would be those Soviet robotic probes mentioned by Space.com, which presumably did land on the moon. A number of those probes, which were part of the Apollo-era lunar program, were very similar in size and shape to the lunar modules certainly enough so that images of much higher resolution would be required to make a definitive judgment. Actually, after studying the image above, and you have to see this image, one of the alleged lunar probes, I'm going to have to say that the Soviets were lying their asses off almost as much as NASA was. There's no way I'm going to buy into the notion that the Soviets sent a free-form abstract sculpture, which appears to have been constructed by Fred Sanford and Granny Clampett on a 234,000-mile journey from Earth to the moon. Careful study of the central area of the photo, however, does reveal why the spacecraft were known as probes. According to NASA, Japan and India have also sent unmanned orbiting spacecraft to the moon in recent years, as has China. 
As with the ESA and NASA's orbiters, they too have failed to return any images of earthly artifacts left behind on the surface of the moon. If the hoax debunking websites are to be believed, by the way, the reason that no one has returned to the moon in 37 years is because we pretty much already tapped that celestial body for all the information it had to offer. There's really, you see, nothing much left to see there. A quote debunking article posted by abcnews.com, for example, quoted Val German, the president of the Central Missouri Astronomical Association, as saying, quote, There's no reason to go back. Quite frankly, the moon is a giant parking lot. There's just not much there. I wonder why it is then that just about everyone wants to send unmanned probes there, or to train enormously powerful telescopes on the moon's surface. What could they possibly learn about the, quote, parking lot from those distances that our astronauts didn't already discover by actually being there? These pictures are great. You have to go check them out. Some true believers also claim that what was dubbed the Lunar Laser Ranging Experiment also proves that we really went to the moon. As the story goes, the astronauts on Apollo 11, Apollo 14, and Apollo 15 all allegedly left small laser targets sitting on the lunar terrain. One of them can be seen in the official NASA photograph reproduced below, so that scientists back home could then bounce lasers off the targets to precisely gauge the distance from the Earth to the Moon. According to the debunkers, the fact that observatories to this day bounce lasers off the alleged targets proves that the Apollo missions succeeded. It is perfectly obvious, though, that the targets, if there, could have been placed robotically, most likely by the Soviets. It is also possible that there are no laser targets on the moon. In December 1966, National Geographic reported that scientists at MIT had been achieving essentially the same result for four years by bouncing a laser off the surface of the moon. The New York Times added that the Soviets had been doing the same thing since at least 1963. There was much about the Apollo flights that was truly miraculous, but arguably the greatest technological achievement was the design of the lunar modules. Has anyone, by the way, ever really taken a good look at one of those contraptions? I mean, a detailed, up-close look? I'm guessing the vast majority of people have not. But luckily, we can quickly remedy that situation because I happen to have a really good, high-resolution image that comes directly from the good people at NASA. While what is depicted in the images may initially appear to the untrained eye to be some kind of mock-up that someone cobbled together in their backyard to make fun of NASA, I can assure you that it is actually an extremely high-tech manned spacecraft capable of landing on the surface of the moon. And incredibly enough, it was also capable of blasting off from the moon and flying 69 miles back up into the lunar orbit. Though not immediately apparent, it is actually a two-stage craft. The lower half, the part that looks like a tubular aluminum framework covered with mylar and old Christmas wrapping paper, being the descent stage, and the upper half, the part that looks as though it was cobbled together from old air conditioning ductwork, is primarily held together as can be seen in the close-up with zippers and gold tape being the ascent stage. The other half, of course, is the more sophisticated portion, being capable of lifting off and flying with enough power to break free of the moon's gravity and reach lunar orbit. It also, of course, possessed sophisticated enough navigational capabilities for it to locate literally out of the middle of frickin' nowhere the command module that it had to dock with in order to get the astronauts safely back to Earth. It also had to catch that command module, which was orbiting the moon at a leisurely 4,000 miles per hour. But we'll get to all that a little later. I think we can all agree for now that such a sleek, stylish, well-designed craft would have no problem flying with that kind of power, precision, and stability. There is one thing that appears to be a problem, though. How did they get everything on board these modules that they were going to need to successfully complete their missions? According to NASA, the modules were, excluding the landing pads, were only about 12 feet in diameter. That is obviously not a whole lot of space to work with. So let's try to think of everything that we would need if we were astronauts venturing off on a little journey to the moon. First of all, of course, we would have to account for the space taken up by the various components of the ship itself. There is the framework and the, uh, let's call it the fuselage of the craft, uh, we will need uh, a lot of very sophisticated navigation and guidance communications equipment, all of which took up a whole lot more space back in the 60s than it would today. And then, needless to say, there is the power supply, or rather multiple power supplies. For the descent stage, there is the reverse thrust rocket that allegedly allowed the craft to make soft landing on the moon. And then for the ascent stage, there is a more powerful rocket to propel the random bundle of sheet metal into lunar orbit. There are also additional rockets to allegedly stabilize the vessel in flight, the random clusters of what look like bicycle horns. Next up is the massive amount of fuel that would be required to power all of those rockets for both the ascent and descent stages of the mission. The ascent stage in particular is going to be a bit of a fuel hog, 
as ascending 69 miles and breaking free of the moon's gravity is a formidable challenge, to say the least. Though it might only have one-sixth the gravitational pull of the Earth, keep in mind that it's still a force strong enough to create the tides here on Earth, 234,000 miles away. I'm not a rocket scientist, by the way, so I'm sure that there are quite a few components that I'm leaving off my lunar module. But that's okay, because our spaceship is already feeling really cramped just with the stuff listed so far, and we're just getting started. Next, we'll have to include everything required to keep ourselves alive and well. We aren't going to be there very long, of course, and space is obviously limited, but we will still require some basic amenities. We will, after all, have to have somewhere to sleep in the ship, won't we? Or will we just unfold cots on the lunar surface? We'll also require a sanitation septic system of some kind, or do those missions bring about another first that NASA has been reluctant to brag about? Which astronaut has the distinction of being the first to soil the lunar landscape? Anyway, getting back to our packing list, in addition to a sanitation system, it is imperative that we bring along an adequate supply of food, water, and oxygen, and not just enough to last for the planned duration of our visit, but enough to supply a small safety cushion, should anything go wrong. Because from what I've heard, running out of food, water, and oxygen while on the moon can really mess up an otherwise perfectly good trip. The oxygen is especially important, so we're going to need a really good, reliable system to deliver that oxygen and to, you know, recharge the oxygen tanks in our spacesuit so we can walk around on the moon and jump like eight or nine inches high like the Apollo guys did. And a backup oxygen system probably wouldn't be a bad idea. We're also going to need to install a top-of-the-line heating and cooling system, probably several of them, actually, because the, quote, weather on the moon, so to speak, can be a bit unpleasant. According to the experts over at NASA, daytime highs average a balmy 260 degrees Fahrenheit, but it cools off quite a bit at night, dropping to an average of minus 280 Fahrenheit. So if you're looking for anything between those two extremes, you really won't find it on the moon. It's pretty much one or the other. If you're in the sun, you're going to be boiled alive, and if you're out of the sun, you're going to be flash frozen. I'm not at all sure how the air conditioning system is going to work, come to think of it, since air conditioning requires a steady supply of, and please stop me if I'm stating the obvious here, air. And the moon really doesn't have a lot of that. It would help, of course, if our spacecraft was heavily insulated in some manner, but that doesn't appear to be the case. So we'll need a really good heating and cooling system and plenty of Freon for whatever it is that we'll need to keep it running. And so now, add up all of the following to our already crowded spacecraft, ourselves, a minimal amount of room to sleep and otherwise take care of basic necessities of life, some type of plumbing and sewage system, really good heating and cooling system, a considerable food supply, water, oxygen, and we're still not done packing for our trip. Now we have to add all the equipment that will be required to maintain the ship and complete our planned missions. First of all, we're going to definitely need to pack an exhaustive supply of spare parts and wide variety of tools. That's an absolute must. And from what I've heard, there are a few stores on the moon that do stock spaceship parts, but they tend to close on certain days of the week. And orders from the mainland can take a frustrating long time to arrive, so it's always best to be prepared for an emergency. There are lots of things that can go wrong with our spaceship, and the only thing harder than finding a good mechanic here on Earth is finding one on the moon. And then, of course, we'll have to bring all the fancy testing equipment that we'll use to pretend to conduct experiments. Some of it is quite bulky, so we'll need to set aside some storage space for all of that. And we're going to need some additional storage to bring back all those petrified wood samples. But we should have room for that after we jettison most of the fake testing equipment. Our spaceship is now so ridiculously overloaded that we may have had to add a roof rack, and we still aren't even quite done yet. We still have a couple more items to pack, and we probably should have gotten them on sooner because they're going to require a lot of space, since this is one of the later Apollo flights you see. And we also have to pack a dune buggy, otherwise known as a lunar rover, and the picture's down here, guys. And the rovers, according to NASA, are a full 10 feet long, just 2 feet less than the diameter of our, of our craft. But not to worry, according to NASA, the rovers, pictured below, folded up to the size of a large suitcase. When released, they would just sort of magically unfold and snap into place, ready to roam the lunar terrain. To be perfectly honest, I'm not really sure why we have to pack the damn rover. There is no real compelling reason to take it to the moon except for the fact that they make for good TV, and that seems to be of paramount importance. And so, as can be seen below, it should easily fit into our spaceship. One last thing we're going to need is a whole lot of batteries. Lots and lots of batteries. That's going to be the only way to power this ship while we're on the moon, and we'll definitely need to run the communication systems, and the oxygen supply system, and the heating and cooling systems, uh, and the cabin lights, and the TV cameras, and transmitters, and all the testing equipment, and our spacesuits, and that damn rover. And we won't be able to recharge any of the various batteries, so we're going to need like a lot of backups. Uh, especially the really big batteries that run the ship. We may need a separate ship just to carry all the batteries that we're going to need. By the way, I can't possibly be the only one who's disappointed that we never followed up on that breakthrough folding vehicle technology. If 
we had folding moon buggies back in the early 70s, then how far behind could folding automobiles have been had we chosen to stay the course? Had NASA's pioneering vision been followed up, we could all be folding up our cars and tucking them away under our office desks. But, as with all the Apollo technology, it existed only in that specific period of time and has now, sadly, been lost to the ages. NASA has done something very odd, by the way, with the lunar module that it has on display for museum visitors to marvel at. It has staffed it with miniature astronauts wearing miniature spacesuits. The module may be scaled slightly larger than the real modules that allegedly landed on the moon. I wonder why they would do that. I'm pretty sure that Buzz and Neil were of normal stature. So the only reason that I could think that they would use miniature astronauts would be to portray the modules as larger than what they actually were, and in better condition, too. Did they pick up the ones they sent to the moon at a used car lot? Before moving on, I need to emphasize here just how sophisticated the lunar modules actually were. These remarkable spacecraft, and I understandably get a little choked up here talking about this because I'm just so damn proud of our team of Nazi scientists, managed to make six perfect takeoffs from the surface of the moon. And understand here, people, that they did that, amazingly enough, with completely untested technology. We can't duplicate the conditions on the moon here at home, you see, or even provide a rough approximation. And since no one had ever been to the moon, they didn't exactly know what to replicate anyway, so this part of the mission was pretty much of a crapshoot. Conditions on the moon are, to say the least, a bit different than here on Earth. The gravitational pull is only about one-sixth of what it is here. And then there is that whole lack of atmosphere thing, and the decidedly unearthly temperatures. And then, of course, there are high levels of space radiation. I'm quite sure that we had the best minds available working on the Apollo project, but none of them could have accurately predicted and compensated for how all those unearthly conditions would combine to affect the flight potential of the lunar modules. So the ability of the modules to actually blast off from the moon and fly was, at best, a theoretical concept. It is also important to remember that, unlike the initial blast-off from Earth, seen above, which involved the collective efforts of thousands of people and the use of all types of peripheral equipment, the astronauts taking off from the moon only had themselves and a strange vessel that looked like it had been salvaged from the set of Lost in Space. What would you be thinking, by the way, if you suddenly found yourself on the surface of the moon with what looked like a cheap movie prop as your only way home? Would you feel comfortable hanging around for a few days, doing experiments, confident that when the time came, the untested contraption behind you would actually get you back home from the moon? Or would the words, bad career choice, be running through your head? But as it turns out, America kicked ass back then, and those lunar modules performed like champions every single time. They didn't even need modifications. Despite the completely foreign environment, they worked perfectly, the first time, every time thereafter. On Earth, it took many long years of trial and error, many failed test flights, many unfortunate accidents, and many, many trips back to the drawing board before we could safely and reliably launch men into low Earth orbit. But on the moon? We nailed that shit the very first time. Today, of course, we can't even launch a space shuttle from right here on the planet without occasionally blowing one up, even though we have lowered our sights considerably. After all, sending spacecraft into low Earth orbit is considerably easier than sending spacecraft all the way to the friggin' moon and back. It would appear then that we can draw the following conclusion. Although technology has advanced immeasurably since the first Apollo moon landing, and we have significantly downgraded our goals in space, we can't come close to matching the kick-ass safety record we had in the Apollo days. The thing is that back in the frontier days, we didn't need all that fancy technology and book learning to send Buzz and the boys to the moon and back. But then, back then we had that American can-do spirit. We just cowboyed up and MacGyvered those spaceships to the moon. All we needed was an old Volkswagen engine, some duct tape, and a roll of bailing wire. Throw a little toilet paper and tang on board and you're good to go. How about the speed with which we cranked out those Apollo spacecraft? Once we figured out how to make them, we were stamping them out like Coke cans. We fired off seven of them in just under three and a half years, or about one every six months. Given the extreme complexity of those vessels, and the fact that every component had to perform flawlessly under largely unknown conditions, that's a pretty impressive production schedule. America, I think it's safe to say, totally rocked back then. And that's the end of part two of Wagging the Moon Doggy by David McGowan. Follow the links over in the blog post or uh, head over to centerforinformedamerica.com and head down to the Moon Doggy tab and check it out. Go support Dave and his family with a purchase of a book or a donation. And thank you for joining me. Catch you next time. And then for the ascent stage, there's a more powerful rocket to propel the random bundle. <laughs> There's also additional rockets to allegedly stabilize the vessel in flight. The random clusters of what would look like... <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 oh.
man. I'm not at all sure how the air conditioning system is going to work, come to think of it, since air conditioning requires a steady supply of, and please stop me if I'm stating the... <laughs>